Chris, I'm so tired. I was up all night long with the kids, man. Yeah, you look pretty out of it. Can I ask you a question? Why are you putting googly eyes on the Ronin? It's not a Ronin. This is Rhonda, and she was very supportive last night. Rhonda. Okay, just hand over the camera slowly, George. You don't just hand over a person. That's not how people work, Chris. Welcome back, DP Review TV viewers. It's a slightly delirious Jordan here to talk about the very interesting new DJI Ronin 4D. Now I want to take you on a bit of a history lesson because a while back, DJI introduced the Ronin. Now it wasn't the first three axis handheld gimbal to hit the market, but it was by far the least expensive at the time. And it opened up just a ton of really cool creative possibilities for moving the camera. It was a really interesting device and changed how I shoot video quite a bit. But then a little while after that, DJI had another creative idea. They created the Osmo, which was a little handheld stabilizer with a camera built right into it. Now the quality wasn't great, like your phone would probably shoot better video, but in a pinch when you need a little movement in the shot, it was a really cool tool to have. So now we have the DJI Ronin 4D, and you could look at it as either a full-size Ronin with a camera built into it, or as like a really big-ass Osmo. But either way, it opens up a lot of really interesting creative possibilities. There's both 6K and 8K models out there. We were sent the 6K model to test. Time for a quick spec rundown. We have a full-frame 6K sensor, interchangeable DJI DL mount, LiDAR for autofocus and focus assist, and four axes of stabilization, all for $71.99 USD. Now, I'm not trying to be insulting, but Rhonda here is pretty hefty, and we're talking five kilos, that's two and a half Nikkor knots for a more accessible weight unit. Now, one thing that really helps with that weight is with the old Ronins, they were kind of underslung, so you'd have to get your arms up really high in order to get them to eye level. Here, the handles are kind of underneath the camera, so when you're shooting eye level, it's actually quite comfortable. You can just push it right into your chest. However, if I was doing a full day of shooting, I would definitely buy something like an Easy Rig. There's a 3 8 bolt right on the top to attach that to and just make your shooting a lot more comfortable. All that weight's not for nothing though. For starters, we have a beautiful five and a half inch touch screen that also has a lot of physical controls on it. I really love that. It means you can still operate it in the cold. We've also got very solid feeling locks and controls for balancing the gimbal. Feels just like a full size Ronin. But the focus ring is the main thing I want to focus on right now. Oh huh? Lord, Jordan, no. Rhonda thought it was funny. So what we've got here is a very smooth focus ring when you're rotating it to manually pull focus. But you can use this for other settings. So I can use it for ISO or ND, and then it'll get very resistant click stops as I cycle through all of those exposure settings. There's also something called automated manual focus, and it's autofocus, but I can feel the manual focus ring moving as the camera is changing focus. Any moment, put my thumb on it and override it. It sounds confusing, but it's actually really intuitive in use, and I absolutely love this feature. I'm not usually a fan of wearing camo, but I really like this new color, this uh, urban canvas camo. Uh, I think it's really popping for me. I'm really worried about you. Uh, where were we? History of the Ronin. So there was a Ronin 1, Ronin 2, and now we've got the Ronin 4D. Why did they go right to 4? Well, it's because of the new fourth axis. And this is my favorite party trick on this camera. Push the 4D button, boy -o -o suddenly we are compensating for any kind of bounce while you're walking with the camera, which is something that 3-axis gimbals really can't help you with at all. We've got very little bounce in the footage. It is very stable while we're walking with this. Now, I do want to mention, you really want to make sure that you fine tune the balance on it. If your balance is off, it's actually going to look worse than not having the fourth axis enabled at all. But when it's working properly, you can see it's a really cool look. And it's pretty amazing having this built right on without having to add a separate accessory. Okay, Chris, I'm going to let you handle Rhonda, but you treat her well, okay? Let's talk about ProRes, because that's one of the coolest things on this camera. It is the first non-drone camera that can record ProRes RAW internally. Now, this is really editable within Final Cut, gives you tons of control over white balance and exposure, and you can get plugins if you want to edit these files in Premiere and Avid. However, it is not supported in DaVinci Resolve, which is one of the most popular grading programs out there. So, what that means is you've got two other options. We have the industry standard ProRes 422HQ. These are enormous files, but 
very editable, very well supported throughout the industry. We also get a very small H.264 compressed 10-bit 420, still fairly flexible in the grade, but these are very tiny files. It gives you a lot of flexibility to play with these in a variety of different editing programs. As far as the actual image quality, I do think that this is the same or a very similar sensor to the one that we saw in the Panasonic S1H. Its native sensitivities are very similar. If you're shooting D-Log, it's 800 and 5,000 ISO on that. Now, rolling shutter is still going to be a very big concern if you're using the full width of the sensor, just like the S1H, and you're going to have to deal with the crop if you want to use the 60 frame per second record modes. So yes, there are a variety of crop factors on this camera, but it does it in a really interesting way. So what it can do is 6K60 using the full width of the sensor, but then it actually lops the top and bottom of the frame off. It gives you a 2, 3, 9 to 1 kind of a scope aspect ratio for shooting that way. Now you can also go down to 4K60. It can go into a Super 35 mode at 17 by 9, just like the S1H or a lot of the other cameras will do. All right, so how are you gonna get all of your footage stored on this camera? They actually give you a lot of flexibility there. You can use a standard CF Express Type B card. They're fairly expensive, but really reliable. Or DJI has their own proprietary SSD format. It's really cool because it actually locks into the camera, feels very secure, and has a little USB plug on it, so it's really easy to transfer off of it. But if you want more affordable storage, you can just plug a like Samsung T5 or T7 SSD right into the USB port on this, and it'll write right to it, just like the Blackmagic cameras do. I mean, you'll need some double-sided Velcro to stick it to the side of the camera or do some kind of rig thing. Who knows? But it does give you some affordable storage. The only real drawback with this camera is there's no option to do backup recording simultaneously having it go to two formats, which seems weird since it can record out to three different media types. Ah, oh, look at that beautiful Calgary skyline at Infinity Focus there. I can just stare at it forever unless someone incredibly charismatic just exploded into the frame and started walking towards the camera. In those situations, I'm gonna need Chris to pull focus and I think he might have just done an incredibly good job because he's got a really cool new focus assist tool. Now, this uses the LiDAR, it's called their Focus Waveform, and it's like a video game, it's super cool. It's like Rainbow Six, old school, like the planning stage. I never played Rainbow Six, but apparently it's very similar. It gives you like an overhead view of your subjects in the frame, and it makes it very easy for you to pull focus from one to the other and see exactly where you're focused and how far away you are from your subject. Now the focus waveform does take a little bit of practice to get used to because you always want to focus on the front of the object. Say if it's a person and you put your focus right in the middle, it's going to be focused on their ears, kind of back focus. So you always want to remember that. But if you're having trouble with it, it is nice that they still include your traditional focus assist tools like focus peaking and focus magnification. Now as far as the actual manual focus experience, if you're using electronic lenses, then that focus ring is just beautiful and responsive. You don't need any kind of mechanical system hooked up. But if you're using adapted lenses or cinema lenses, old manual focus glass, then you've got a mechanical motorized follow focus rig, which is included right in the box with this. And this mechanical focus motor means that you actually get autofocus with manual focus lenses with some real quirks. I'm gonna talk about that later. Now the 4D isn't perfect. This uh, foul smelling back alley seems like the perfect place to talk about a couple things that really piss me off. Starting with the battery life on this, I find generally I'm getting about 80 minutes. Now, that might not seem like a huge problem, but the other issue comes into play, which is the incredibly long shutdown and startup time. Because of that, I don't want to turn the camera off in between takes. So in a practical situation, you're going to be needing to charge this battery all the time or just have a few spares with you if you're doing a full day of shooting. So I want to go out and test that huge variety of lenses and get some footage for you. But before I do any of that, I want to go sleep. So Chris is going to beautifully pull focus on me as I walk away and I'll catch up with you guys a little bit later. Okay, we're back after I've had a chance to try a whole bunch of different lenses on this, and that's one of the coolest things with the DJI Ronin 4D is it has interchangeable lens mounts. It ships with DJI's own DL lens mount. They've got a few small lenses for that, but you can also get right now an E mount or an M mount. And what's great about those is they're very short flange distances, so you can adapt other lens mounts on top of that. But there are some real limitations. So for starters, when I use E-mount lenses with this, there is electronic communication. So I can use my follow focus ring, control the focus, I can adjust aperture on the lens electronically. However, it doesn't actually know how far away it's focused, so the LiDAR doesn't work properly. Now, this camera has an option called lens calibration, and you focus at a bunch of different distances 
to tell the electronics how far it should be focusing at different distances, and that does kind of work, but it's not super precise and you have to do a ton of calibrations to make it function properly. It can store profiles for a whole bunch of different lenses, but it means on set you're not going to grab a lens out of your bag and have autofocus with it. As well when I use manual focus Nikkor AI lenses, those actually focus in a different direction from most lenses and there's no way in the menu system for me to say, oh I need to switch my focus direction. So it would always be confused trying to focus at minimum and it's going to infinity. You'll run into the same issue if you're using Pentax K-mount lenses and I couldn't find a workaround. Now the good news is I'm sure that's something they could easily address in firmware. The other thing I was really worried about is what if you adapt larger lenses to it, but the gimbal can actually support a fair amount of weight. I used a pretty chunky Sigma 35mm f1.4 and it was able to balance that. Now you can use zoom lenses on this, but just remember like all other gimbals, every time you change the focal length you'll need to refloat the gimbal, so I just think primes make a lot more sense. Nice, small, easy to balance, it's the way to go. The other thing I really wanted to test more extensively was the autofocus on this, because it's very different from what we've seen before with contrast detect or phase detect on the sensor. It actually uses a separate LiDAR unit. Now, what's really interesting about that is light levels don't really affect your autofocus performance. So it does a really good job, like you can see here, in very low light. But you also have to understand how the LiDAR works is it's always looking for the front of a subject. So I do run into situations like this where Chris is wearing a hat, it's always focusing on the brim instead of his eye, which is a little bit further back. So when you run into issues like that, this is where I love that focus mode I mentioned before, the automated manual focus. Just give a nudge on the focus ring and you can quickly correct the focus when it acts up in those situations. There's also a really interesting optional accessory for this. It gives you a big 7-inch display that can wirelessly communicate with the camera. It uses the same technology DJI do in their drones, so it's got huge range and it lets you operate the camera remotely. Now, you can actually clip the handles off the side of the camera, attach them to the monitor so it feels just like you're actually operating the camera, and gives you access to focus, exposure controls, all of those kind of things. And I can see it just being brilliant if you're doing like a car cam setup, or even if you just have an AC on set instead of spending all the money to get a wireless video transmission system and wireless system for the follow focus unit. All of that is included in this rig. I mean, it's not cheap, but it's way less than those. And it's not going to be great if you're one-man band, but if you're on set, this is going to be invaluable and quite reasonable. So when the DJI 4D was first announced, it made a lot of very lofty promises, and now that I've spent a few weeks with it, how many of those does it actually live up to? So there's some features that actually lived up to, or I would even say surpassed my expectations, like the focus waveform is one of the best focus systems I have ever used. The manual focus wheel on this with that haptic feedback feels absolutely fantastic, and the assisted manual focus is my new favorite way for autofocus to work. I want this on all kinds of cameras. The whole system is really, really intuitive, but there are some real limitations in this, like the long startup time and short battery life mean it's not going to be great for like fly on the wall documentary stuff. As well, I do wish there was an option for maybe a sensor with a little less resolution, but a faster readout speed for doing high speed work, or if you're doing a lot of action, which I expect you'll do with this kind of gimbal camera where you don't want the rolling shutter in the image. We'll have to test out the 8K sensor in the future and see how that performs, but I'd love to see something like the Sony a7S III lower resolution sensor available for this. And the other thing is, even after multiple calibrations using things like E-mount lenses or manual focus lenses with the autofocus motor, it's just not very consistent. If you want a good autofocus experience, you're really limited to using those DJI lenses and there's not a lot of options right now. So hopefully we'll see better firmware for E-mount or a whole pile of new DJI lenses in the future. So yes, there are some limitations, but I can't get away from the fact this is the most innovative new video product that I've seen in maybe a decade. Just a lot of really cool new technology here. I can't wait to see what DJI does as a camera manufacturer in the future. And if you want to see my opinion on some of that, you're going to want to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget, check out dpreview.com for some great articles on photo and video tools. And we will see you all again with more DP Review TV. Is it still following me? Is the autofocus working? That's so cool.